Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, as is typical of, uh, of this job, uh, it goes from meeting to meeting, speech to speech, so I'm sorry to have come in late, and uh, let me predict that I'll leave right after I finish as well in order to, uh, to catch a plane. But uh, let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on uh, which we meet here this morning and pay my respects to their elders, past uh, and present. Uh, to uh, Rear Admiral James Goldrick, uh, to Australian Naval Institute President Vice Admiral Peter Jones, uh, the very many distinguished guests who are here, to Michael Freighter and uh, Tom Frame, to my uh, old distinguished friend Andrew Blythe up there who uh, appears to have armed himself with the camera. Uh, it's a, uh, a great opportunity to, uh, to be here this morning and, uh, and believe me, ladies and gentlemen, if I'm choosing between estimates and uh, speech to the Australian Naval Institute, it won't take you too long to guess who, uh, I was going to say comes up trumps, but I won't, who wins. <coughs> that's, a, um, that's just an indication of, of my interest in, uh, in uh, that side of life, cards, races, things like that, but there we are. Let me congratulate both the Institute uh, and the Australian Centre for the Study of Armed Conflict and Society for, for bringing together what uh, it seems to me, uh, on a, on a uh, brief observation, is a very valuable program and, as uh, Peter said, a uh, long list of uh, diverse and, uh, in a number of cases, myself accepted, of course, esteemed speakers. Uh, this year's seminar's theme, Maritime Operations in the uh, Littoral, is, as Peter said, very timely given the uh, White Paper's strong focus on uh, associated issues, particularly amphibious capability development, uh, and also timely given, given the uh, relatively recent first uh, fully operational deployment of uh, HMAS Canberra. Uh, in fact, in literally my first week as uh, Minister for Defence last year, I visited HMS, HMAS Canberra during the uh, Sea Raider exercise near Townsville. I uh, travelled with, uh, with a team from uh, Canberra to Townsville on the uh, wedge tail and uh, then by uh, MRH 90 out to the ship. Now, not many things are left to chance in defence, if anything, so I don't think that was serendipitous. I think the Secretary and the CDF thought, where will we start? That looks like a good idea. To highlight the capability of HMAS Canberra in the first instance, uh, and particularly the ADF's focus on integrating as a joint force, uh, seemed to them, I am sure, and uh, in retrospect, most certainly to me, as a, uh, a very good opportunity in my first days as, uh, as minister. It demonstrated the importance being placed on and certainly the pride in the development of these capabilities. So the development of our amphibious capability and the ability to operate as a joint force are two factors that will heavily influence the effectiveness of our operations in the littoral. By definition, the littoral includes the areas seaward of the coast which are susceptible to influence from the land and the areas inland from the coast which are susceptible to influence from the sea. So logically, defence operations in the littoral demand effective joint operations. So while we talk about maritime operations in the littoral, it is important that we also consider this as a joint endeavour. In the Defence White Paper, which was in fact launched uh, only in February this year, although that does seem an eon ago on the, uh, on the 2016 timescale, the Defence White Paper set out three strategic interests to guide our defence planning. And they are a secure, resilient Australia. Defence to be provided with the resources it needs to act independently to defend Australia's air, sea and northern approaches. A secure, nearer region, including maritime Southeast Asia and the South Pacific and a stable Indo-Pacific region and rules-based global order that supports our interests. Our region is the most vibrant in the world. It's home literally to half the world's population, the three largest economies and 12 of the G20 member nations. It's a hub of trade, of the world's busiest ports, nine out of 10 and 16 out of the top 20 are located in the Indo-Pacific. Instability in the region would threaten Australia's security and our vital and growing economic relationships. In Australia, 
More than 80 per cent of Australians live within 50 kilometres of the coast. Uh, indeed, as Dr Peter Dean of the Australian National University's Strategic and Defence Studies Centre has observed, in fact, 75 per cent of the population in the Indo-Pacific live within 200 kilometres of the coast. Clearly, the littoral areas of our region are extensive. Our ability to operate effectively in these areas is vital to ensuring we can defend Australia and protect our interests in our immediate region. And I'd reference again our three strategic interests as outlined in the Defence White Paper. Now, not for one second before uh, I set anyone's uh, hearts palpitating, do I suggest that the need for blue water operations to keep our sea lines of communication open will diminish in the current strategic environment? But the reality is that the range of potential operational requirements in the littoral is indeed very broad. It's a range of requirements that continues to grow, particularly as the government and the population continue to turn to the ADF to fulfil more non-traditional non-war fighting roles. Therefore, our ability to operate effectively in the littoral is fundamental to the ADF's ability to seize the opportunities and respond to challenges over the coming decades. And the Defence White Paper set out uh, our plans, our observations in great detail over the, over the first decade from 2016 and more broadly in the general over the second decade to 2035. We have to also consider this in the context of our rapidly changing strategic security environment. And we must be prepared to think differently in how we go about best preparing the ADF to fight and to win. In the Defence White Paper, not only did the Turnbull government commit to ensuring Australia maintains a regionally superior ADF with the highest levels of military capability and scientific and technological sophistication, it also placed more emphasis on the joint force, which means the ADF will be able to apply more force, more rapidly and more effectively when required. Responsiveness and flexibility to provide the most useful assistance to our neighbours when requested will demand an enhanced joint amphibious capability, which is at the heart of Australia's strategic effectiveness in the littoral. In peacetime, an effective amphibious capability allows us to send a self-contained joint force to exercise with our neighbours. Furthermore, it provides a critical asset for uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations, and Operation Fiji Assist would be the most uh, timely and pertinent recent example of that. Uh, effective in, in the extreme, effective across so many aspects of our engagement with Fiji, of the HADR work itself, uh, and in a way that I think even the most optimistic observers had not really crystallised until we actually saw it happen. The White Paper has set out a plan to strengthen the ADF's capacity for amphibious operations through capability development, centred on our two Canberra-class large amphibious ships and enhanced amphibious capabilities across the three services. The Canberra-class underpins ADF amphibious capability through their capacity to facilitate a range of operations, including supporting the security of maritime Southeast Asia and Pacific Island countries and addressing emergent threats in the broader Indo-Pacific region. These two ships provide Australia with a highly capable and sophisticated amphibious deployment capability. Indeed, Canberra and Adelaide have already delivered a more robust and sustainable amphibious capability than at any previous time really in the ADF's peacetime history. As I said, HMAS Canberra returned from her first operational deployment earlier this year, having provided that critical humanitarian assistance and disaster relief to the people of Fiji following Cyclone Winston. What that short notice deployment enabled was the delivery of more than 114 tonnes of emergency relief supplies, three MRH-90 helicopters and around 800 ADF personnel to support Fiji's recovery efforts, something that it would have been much more challenging to achieve without this highly capable Canberra class. Canberra's successful deployment was also testament to the significant progress we've made in growing the ADF's joint amphibious capability. As another example, uh, earlier this year I also had the opportunity to visit Ross Island Barracks in Townsville, 
where the Army maintains a niche capability that contributes to the broader ADF amphibious capability with the provision of shore watercraft, beach landing teams and specialist training. The professionalism of the watercraft squadrons and supporting defence personnel stated, stationed at Ross Island is particularly noteworthy and I congratulated them in their progress uh, in developing and contributing to Australia's amphibious capability. Our current amphibious capability though is far from the finished product. And indeed, as impressive and effective as it is now, there is more to come. As our experience operating the Canberra class grows, we will further invest in the platform. In the future, upgrades to communications and intelligence systems and semi-autonomous self-defence capabilities will better support its joint command and control capability. This will include, for example, communication systems that are compatible with all amphibious force elements watercraft, helicopters and amphibious vehicles to strengthen command and control and uh, Her Majesty's uh, Australian ships Canberra and Adelaide will be the centre of our joint amphibious force for decades. I must say that it doesn't matter the engagement I have with uh, my international uh, counterparts uh, as recently as last week with the uh, Prime Minister of Singapore and the Singaporean Defence Minister uh, Ng. Their commentary and observations on uh, HMAS Canberra or HMAS Adelaide, whichever they have encountered, uh, is extremely powerful, extremely complimentary and compelling. They always take the opportunity to uh, pass observation in relation to that, virtually no matter which counterpart uh, with whom I meet. The government has outlined a number of other future investments in the integrated investment program that will further expand our amphibious capability. Indeed, the ADF's River Arm Patrol capability will be re-established to increase our tactical mobility in the littoral zone. The River Arm Patrol capability will deliver a fleet of lightly armed boats in the mid-2020s to allow operations in a wide range of littoral environments. The capability will provide a force element that is, able, that is capable of effective support to littoral combat operations. We'll also need to support these new capabilities with increased personnel and training facilities. Around 700 additional ADF positions will be needed for force generation for amphibious operations from the Canberra class amphibious ships. <coughs> Excuse me. Amphibious support systems, including over the beach logistics and beached material recovery, armed medium altitude long endurance unmanned aircraft, tactical unmanned aircraft, a long range rocket capability and combat support systems. In the longer term, as indicated in the White Paper, the government will consider a new Northern Advanced Joint Training Area to support large-scale joint and combined amphibious training, in addition to Shoalwater Bay, which is uh, currently our only other large-scale training area with a joint amphibious training capacity. Future challenges in uh, developing the ADF's amphibious capability and integrating communication systems more broadly across the force will need to be addressed. <clears throat> including through building on the existing land network integration centre. This will provide an enhanced battle lab testing facility that will help to ensure systems interoperability across the joint force and also explore more sensitive joint capability solutions for further development. While there's an emphasis on networking and integrating our existing platforms into a joint force, our next generation of platforms must be joint by design. I emphasise that that means designing interoperability into our new platforms and systems. We have to ensure that the ADF is capable of contributing individual platforms or task groups to coalition operations at both the regional and global levels. The ADF's modernisation more broadly will demand close cooperation between the three services who will work, work more closely than ever before as a joint force so that the ADF can provide greater options to apply more force as I said, more rapidly and more effectively when required. Man maintaining our technological edge and capability superiority will require us to design that interoperability from the outset. Integrating the fleet with Army and Air Force platforms and systems is essential to realising our capability potential. Our future ships, aircraft, land forces and submarines have to be designed to work together and also ensure our people are trained to work together to realise the potential of our future force. The leadership of Defence and of the ADF is acutely aware of these requirements 
and each of the three services are currently implementing comprehensive plans to transition their people, their equipment, their supporting elements to ensure that as our new capabilities come into service, we are able to leverage their full potential. As part of Plan Polaris, <coughs> as part of Plan Polaris, the Navy will be generating and deploying self-supported and sustainable maritime task groups capable of accomplishing, accom accomplishing the full spectrum of maritime security operations. These task groups will be flexible, scalable, and structured to achieve the operational outcomes directed by the government. As part of Plan Beersheba, Army has developed an amphibious landing force capability, initially with 2nd Battalion force elements, to assist the development of the ADF's amphibious capability. Under Plan Jericho, Air Force will strengthen the capabilities, <coughs> excuse me, it's not gonna work. Uh, we'll, under Plan Jericho, Air Force will strengthen the capabilities of air and maritime platforms through effective integration and training to provide increased protection for amphibious task groups, better situational awareness, and provide communication gateways so that surface forces can retain information control in contested environments. Further, as outlined in the 2016 White Paper, for the first time, international engagement will become an integrated core function across the entire defence portfolio, aligned with the strategic defence objectives. As Australia's strategic environment becomes more complex, it is important to further develop our international partnerships. Australia can better pursue its objectives of growth and prosperity and protect its interests in our region and globally by working with others, bilaterally, regionally and multilaterally. Earlier this month, I met with US Secretary for Defence, Ash Carter, and we both welcomed the in principle conclusion of cost sharing negotiations for the Force Posture Initiatives. As you know, under the Force Posture Agreement, Australia and the United States will continue to work towards having up to 2,500 US Marines rotating through Northern Australia. Our amphibious landing force, currently based in 2RAR, is developing amphibious capabilities that will enhance Australia's interoperability with the US Marines. The Force Posture Initiatives increase opportunities for combined training and exercises and deepen the interoperability of our armed forces and further the development of our own amphibious capability. These initiatives also provide opportunities for much broader collaboration between Australia, the United States and our partners in the Indo-Pacific. We're also working more closely with our near neighbours and I referred earlier to uh, last week's visit of Prime Minister Lee and uh, his uh, Ministers for Trade, uh, Defence and Foreign Affairs uh, to Australia. Uh, last week, uh, in fact, the Singaporean Defence Minister, uh, Dr Ng, and I signed a memorandum of understanding for military training, unilateral military training uh, for Singapore as part of the Australia-Singapore Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. This will allow up to 14,000 Singapore Armed Forces personnel to conduct unilateral army training in Australia for up to 18 weeks per year, almost trebling current arrangements. Singapore will also upgrade and expand facilities at the Townsville Field Training Area and the Shoalwater Bay Training Area. I'm sure many of you are familiar with both of those locations uh, in their current uh, iteration. They will be larger. Prime Minister Lee wants to see them as state-of-the-art training facilities, uh, an initiative which will benefit not just the capacity of the Singapore Armed Forces in their training activities, but also the ADF. And both of these initiatives the US uh, Force Posture uh, Initiatives and the uh, CSP with Singapore will strengthen our ability to work with our allies and promote regional stability. Ladies and gentlemen, the subject of maritime operations in the littoral is particularly relevant, as I hope I've uh, demonstrated, as we embark on the transformation of the ADF to meet our future challenges. I encourage you, as I know the Chief of Navy also does, to think differently today as you explore the complexities and the new capabilities that will equip the ADF for maritime operations in the littoral. The ADF is highly capable, highly respected for its professionalism worldwide. Our challenge is to maintain our capability edge and prepare for an increasingly complex and uncertain strategic environment that demands innovation and collaboration. 
So I commend you for your collective efforts in bringing together this very impressive seminar. I look forward to uh, learning of today's outcomes and uh, wish you very well in your contemplations today. Thank you very much.